Welcome to News in Context. I'm Gina Valeria. In this episode, we explore how some tenets of media literacy can be co-opted by conspiracy theorists and how to approach media literacy education in a way that ensures students have the skills and abilities to navigate this landscape and assess information holistically. My guest is Dr. Renee Hobbs, Professor of Communication Studies at the Harrington School of Communication and Media at the University of Rhode Island. Renee is also director of the Media Education Lab and author of the new book, Mind Over Media, Propaganda Education in a Digital Age. Renee's Media Education Lab holds a monthly webinar called the Digi URI Media Club. Earlier this month, club members Dr. Jason Schrantz and Michael Stoppel led members in a discussion about how conspiracy theories are affected by media literacy. Schrantz from Gogubit Community College explored the allure of conspiracy theories with fellow club members Davina Sarwate, me, and Renee. What do you think um, makes these conspiracy theories, especially, you know, some of the less playful conspiracy theories, what makes them so seductive? I mean, what what is the the draw? The narrative simplicity, because there's a very well-edged story that people can follow and find their beliefs centered in the story. And I would say also the mystery of it, like the two that I'm most fascinated by are the Kennedy assassination and 9-11 because why did the buildings fall straight down? Like that is actually a question that I want to explore, right? Or how does the magic bullet work in the Kennedy assassination? It's that one thing that makes it plausible that you can investigate. That's intoxicating or compelling. I want to tell a story building on what Gina just said. Back in the 1970s and 1980s, there was a um, national radio uh, talk show host. His name was Art Bell. At night, you could listen to Art Bell and he would tell stories of conspiracy theories. And then there'd be like a call-in opportunity. Like he would take calls from people. And when I was about 12 or 13, it was like the most forbidden thing that I could possibly do as a good Catholic school girl, right? Listen to late night radio about conspiracy theories. And one night when I was like 13, I called in to the radio show. And I, I, I fearfully stammered out some kind of reaction. And I reflected a lot on that because I feel like I, I recognize like the point about simplicity. It was like it was easy enough for a 12 year old to have an opinion about. And I felt so powerful in having opinion. It was like actually the first form of political opinion I actually ever had. There is this kind of um, allure to them because it it's this uh, um, invitation to not accept the narrative, the dominant narrative. And so it lets the viewer, the listener, or whatever, to become involved, to be able to make decisions on their own. There's some power to that. And I was just thinking with some of the the two conspiracy theories that, that Gina mentioned, there's also a difference in, you know, a conspiracy theory that's based around, you know, I'm thinking like Pizzagate or the Sandy Hook hoax, like a conspiracy theory that's based around um, an unwillingness to believe the facts of the story or an un- unwillingness to to accept you know the the news that is but then there's also theories around like things like 9-11 and um Kennedy assassination where there's actually information that's privileged that that we don't have the full story maybe it's because of security reasons um but there's information that's being withheld so there's there's no other option other than to kind of piece together the details of the story fred haas who teaches english and journalism in the boston area reminded us that conspiracy theorists aren't always who we think they are and that any of us can be susceptible. People like to think that it is that tinfoil hat person, but actually the majority of us are highly vulnerable to this, whether we want to admit it or not, because um, those influential factors, like we are all sort of preyed upon with relative ease. Like it appeals to our inner teenager, right? Like we, we've got the inside track on this. There's also a kind of social proof, right? Where you're getting um, these things reflected back to you by um, like a whole number of people. 
there's also uh, kind of like consistency because they never really go away, right? So you keep seeing they can't be around for this long if there's no truth in it. And on some level, the cult thing made it struck a chord to me too, is because so many of these theories, on some level, there there's a very short leap of faith involved because of the plausibility that Gina was ma- mentioning earlier. Sarwate also pointed out that in addition to plausibility and simplicity, social media algorithms are playing a role in fueling conspiracy theories. It's fun to see how, um, you know, they pump you up to find those connections between separate things. And then the algorithm sort of keeps feeding those connections to you. It feels like a moment of epiphany for you. Oh, I knew that this was related to the conspiracy and that was too. And then you feel like you have drawn the connection. And that actually is not the case. What I appreciate about that point, Davina, is you're acknowledging that there is pleasure in that, right? That this is a fun thing. Conspiracy theories are fun. Yeah, there's that dopamine hit when you get when you realize that there's a connection and other people maybe support that connection or there's one more thing that explains something for you. It's a it's a little hit and it want, you want to find the next one. Yeah, but sometimes I have the feeling as well that um, actually people they want to show that they know better or we cannot play them. Those last two voices were Schrantz and Michael Stopel, user services librarian for the American University of Paris. <music> In this episode, part two of my conversation with Renee Hobbs, we explore the limitations of media literacy taught in isolation, including how it can be flipped by conspiracy theorists, as well as the importance of teaching media literacy holistically and hand in hand with things like empathy, discernment, art, and collaboration. A lot of our media literacy challenges seem to be coming from the way people are consuming information on digital media and the echo chambers that are created. How so much media now isn't really created to inform people, but it's created to cater to people on different parts of the political spectrum. And that means that people are starting to hold up demonstrably false information and point to the actual factual information as simply the opinion held by the other side. This really feels like it's caused us to see each other with less humanity. As an example, on August 23rd, the number of deaths in the U.S. hit 176,000. At that time, a CBS YouGov poll was released, and it found that 57% of Republicans surveyed said that that number of deaths was acceptable, that 176,000 deaths was an acceptable loss. That's nearly two-thirds, and that's compared to one-third of independents and 10% of Democrats. Talk about desensitization. It's like to reach the point where it's like, well— Pandemics kill people, so they died. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, I, I, you know. So I think, so yeah, this desensitization that's leading us to sort of become okay slowly with the heat turning up on the stove. You know, I, I mean, I guess, I guess it's related to media literacy, but it is related to the content we're getting. And so how early do you start to sort of debunk or to, to you know, this goes beyond media literacy, teach empathy, teach humanity, teach, you know, I don't know, there, there's all these, all these things we need to do that we're not doing. Well, I think of that in relation to media literacy, because when we start a media literacy inquiry with students, we often start with asking um, people to reflect on their love-hate relationship with media, technology, and culture. Yeah. And people have authentic pleasures and authentic uh, values that um, make media a really important part of their life, a really essential part of their life. Mm-hmm. And people have things that deeply trouble them about the media and technology that are an everyday part of their life. and. When we are in community, when we share in community our unique love-hate relationships, I learn a lot about things I thought were completely unproblematic that you, when you explained why you don't like them, I'm like, oh, I never thought of that before. And when you hear me talk about things I really love, then that helps you appreciate, oh, it might not be as bad as all that. So when we come together in community to be authentic in reflecting on our relationship with media, text, tools, and technologies, we actually encounter our own humanity. So we don't have to teach empathy, right? We can actually cultivate it through dialogue about media. And the reason why that's so authentic is because in the classroom, there's no power politics to get in the way, right? Like 
whether or not you like my new favorite, uh, Kim Convenience, the Canadian sitcom. Oh my God, go rent it, Gina. Okay. It's so great. It's so great. So I like Kim Convenience. It's a, a little sitcom about this Korean family in, in Toronto. It's funny. It's humane. It's sensitive. When I am authentic about my media pleasures, I'm not preaching, you know, I'm not, I'm not transmitting. <laughs> I'm actually sharing my interpretation. And that's really what media literacy, the central pedagogy, right? When we share our interpretations of media, then there's a place for asking questions. There's a place for probing. There's a place for celebrating and valuing, right? And it turns out that our artists and, and writers and poets throughout human history have all used media to share the ineffable qualities of being a human being. Yes. And media still does that. I mean, this show that you're, you're, you're producing aims to do that. So if, if we can really honor the fact that media can uh, express the complexity of being a human, that's the only way we're going to get out. That's the only way we're going to get out of this mess. Artists will save yeah. us. Yeah. I agree. Artists will totally save us. You know, you bring up two things. I want to talk about the artists, but I also I wanted to bring up cultivating empathy through this process. I wonder if media literacy done somewhat in isolation is problematic. And the idea of when I have to bump my views up against someone else's views in a structured setting or, you know, or my interpretations up against someone else's interpretations, that can be really enlightening. And also, and as you say, cultivate empathy, cultivate understanding. And so making sure, yeah, making sure that that interactive engagement piece is there rather than just go do a lateral read and come back and tell me what you found. Oh, so true. Do you know, in my new book coming out this fall called Mind Over Media, Propaganda, Education in a Digital Age, there's one chapter that showcases these two amazing high school social studies teachers from Texas, right? And they, I call them the Emilies. They're the two, two high school teachers in Texas and they have very refined media literacy practice in their social studies class. And you know what they say? A lot of practices that are normative in American public schools, they say these are terrible. Like for instance, don't make a kid go find a newspaper article and write about what it was. Don't make them do that. You turn newspaper reading and news reading into homework. It's a chore. Now the kid really doesn't want to read a newspaper. Don't make kids do that. Then the Emily's also say, sometimes teachers come in and they say, well, we're going to have a debate about a controversial issue like the monuments, the Confederate monuments. Should they uh, tear them down or should they not? And now we're going to make kids debate this side or that side. It says that is a terrible idea because what happens is the debate becomes a competition and the kid wants to win. And the goal is not understanding the issue, it's winning. It's winning the debate. And that is the opposite of understanding an issue. So the third thing that the uh, Emily's do that I report on in, in, my, in my new book is a beautiful one. They say, teachers have this bias. They think that everything they use in the classroom has to be quality. I mean, after all, if you think about it, like. That kind of makes sense, right? When you are your teacher, you know, you bring in good documentaries, you bring in good news stories, good podcasts, you bring in good stuff. But the Emily's say that that does a disservice to kids because you're doing all the work. You picked the good stuff. How do, does the kid learn to develop the capacity to choose for themselves to understand what's good or not good? If you, for the 12 or 15 or 16 or 23 years, <laughs> done all the picking. Yes. So the Emily's show how you can use really bad stuff beautifully in a media literacy classroom for powerful learning. And I find that a very liberating concept, right? Because it means there's not a wrong choice. There's not a bad choice. I can bring any artifact into the classroom. And if I use the right questions and if I have the right spirit of inquiry, learning's going to happen. Yes. On that note, uh, you know, you mentioned stories earlier. And I think stories, artists who tell stories, they can enlighten us. They can help us uh, find humanity and connection. We can see ourselves in them. We can understand an issue. We can experiment inside a safe space. I mean, stories do all of those things. But, but to bring this conversation back to conspiracy theories, stories can also drive conspiracy theories because that simple narrative 
can be so compelling. And um, I used to work at the Commonwealth Club here in San Francisco, and we had a book awards. And so I asked my young adult judge, why? Why do I love all the young adult stories best? This is crazy. And she said, well, it's because of the simple narrative. Like a young adult story is written in a linear fashion. and But they are stories we can all relate to. It's just they're simple and straightforward. Anyway, all that is to say that story. There, stories are another thing that have the... I mean, they have multiple sides, but they have the the positive and the negative sort of aspects to them in this space of conspiracy theories versus enlightenment and education. Such a great observation. And, you know, I know about your own work in looking at kids telling stories about others and about uh, appreciate coming to appreciate people who are different from them through the storytelling practice. So that is really important, uh, you know, scholarship and pedagogy that you're doing in media literacy. I think of storytelling as... Um, the fundamental uh, root of media literacy. And it, it's why, you know, we can really trace media literacy all the way back to the ancient Greeks, right? That it is the art of arrangement, right? It's the way you arrange the stories, right? If you end the chapter with a feeling of suspense, right? If you end the scene uh, episode and the person just has to watch the next one, right? It's the arrangement of the narrative that creates the mm, deep immersion. And, you know, not everybody can do that. I mean, in a way, conspiracy theories are really interesting because of the way they are designed to create that uncertainty, the gap, what's it called, the curiosity gap, right? So I think the more deeply people understand the art of storytelling, the more they recognize when it's being used on them, right? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Understanding that mechanism. <laughs> Wait a second. You're trying to do something. I did that once. <laughs> <laughs> How that game is played. So yeah, so understanding story, story structure. You're listening to News in Context. I'm Gina Valeria. We're talking with Dr. Renee Hobbs about conspiracy theories and media literacy. You mentioned that conspiracy theories can be fun. Like when we're not, when I'm not wallowing in the, oh my God, someone's going to get hurt. This is terrible. What, let's talk a little bit about the fun side of conspiracy theories. So one of my favorite fun conspiracy theories, it's just so fun and it's so charming. It happened in about 2016, I think. And I, I, I came to understand it as the Google autocomplete conspiracy. Okay, so here's the way that conspiracy theory went. Um, as the election, as the presidential election of 2016 was heating up, um, conspiracy theorist Mark Dice uh, on one of his YouTube uh, uh, shows uh, demonstrated sharing his screen on the YouTube and showed us on Google how if he typed in Hillary and then put the word H, it didn't write, it didn't complete health problem. But if, but if he went over to Bing or to some other search Yahoo and he typed in Hillary H, health problem immediately came up, right? And so he demonstrates this. I mean, it's, it's a four minute video, but it's like you're watching with your eyes and it's, it's clear that health problem is not coming up on Google, but it's coming up on the other search engines. And this just became so entertaining to me because it was like, wow, there's a million reasons why his browser produced that result. Right. And again, it comes to understanding mechanisms, understanding story, understanding understanding the mechanism of how a Google search engine has come to work. And it's trying to give us what it thinks we want, not what we need. And, and if you've never been on Bing, Bing has no idea. So Bing is going to be like, I don't know this. <laughs> Whereas Google's <laughs> like, I know you like this. So I'm going to show you. Yeah. The beauty of watching a yeah. group of 15-year-olds wrestle with that and finally put it all together and figure out is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen happen. It's like, gives me shivers every time I get to do it with a group of teenagers. And it still works, right? Because truthfully, lots of people still don't understand how search engines are tied to your online identity. And so that's partly why in my new book, I talk a lot about understanding algorithmic personalization as a form of propaganda that works for our, in entertainment, information, and persuasion. And I think that's really the new frontier with media literacy is we have to figure out a way how to help the general public understand how the choices, the automatically made choices 
uh, for us that are filtering the internet are in fact a form of propaganda that we are complicit in constructing. Uh, and that puts uh, together some ideas about the filter bubble and confirmation bias, but it also ties it to some practices that have become so routine that we don't even think about or understand how they really work. Yes, absolutely. When you talk about, uh, you know, the power of a Google and how they want to give us what we want, uh, this idea of, um, of one, understanding the way the internet works, and, and two, the power of media companies. You mentioned early in our conversation, you know, is it time to regulate social media companies differently? In my mind, it comes with one hour as a populist lack of understanding about how things work, and two, uh, this rampant power that we've, you know, handed over to social media companies who can then make decisions about pulling us into rabbit holes that it thinks we want because that's lucrative and you know the power of the dollar sort of wins here so i'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how we do social media companies aren't necessarily going to be like sure we'll go ahead and fix that so i wonder you know what your thoughts are about our own how we need to understand things better and to what you'd like to see in a regulatory space or from the powers that be oh Whoa, well, this is really, this is a really interesting topic and a complicated one. So I guess I would start by saying last weekend in the New York Times was a full page ad from Facebook and it said, please, government, we would like to be regulated, right? Please, government, we would like to be regulated and you can regulate us on this and this and this. <laughs> Let's control that narrative, shall we? <laughs> and, and I looked at, and I looked at, and, I, and they paid like three hundred or four hundred thousand dollars for that wow. one day on that one page wow. ad, right? And I was like, wow, that is clever, isn't it? Because they're not saying you can regulate us on this other thing, this other thing, and this other thing. But see, here's the thing, and um, this is why having some good understanding of um, media regulation history really help, right? If I believed that um, members of Congress had the capacity to write a law as elegant and as beautiful as the Copyright Act of 1976, which even though it was hammered out in with a lot of uh, negotiation and the publishers and uh, the music industry and the, and the educators and the librarians, are, they were all duking it out ended up writing a balanced piece of legislation that still endures today because it was written with the public interest at heart. But that was a long time ago, more than 50 years ago. And we don't, I don't feel so confident in Congress's ability to mm, hammer out a complex piece of legislation on this topic. Plus, we've also seen in the last 20 years how uh, much corporate interests get their way into the legislative and the regulatory process. So, you know, the media industry has always been in bed with the FCC from the very beginning, restricting and shaping the way that regulatory agency is able to do its job in ensuring that um, media, broadcast media serves the public interest, convenience and necessity. So we've got to a situation where if we look back at the last hundred years of media regulation, every time we tried to regulate it, it actually backfired and had the opposite effect because of the way the kind of corruption or propaganda persuasion that happens, the influence, the, the synergistic influence between business and government, like that's an uns unstoppable force and letting them hammer out regulation of the internet or no regulation? I, I, I'm not sure what to recommend. You know, if good government, my belief in good government, I'm kind of an optimist at heart, maybe they could figure it out. But I actually think we need a much stronger activist community. We have actually very a very small activist community. They've all been bought out by tech companies, right? I mean, they've all been bought out. Why are they investing so heavily in universities? Because everybody has taken 
that tech money one way or the other and is tainted. We don't have a robust activist community in this space. I mean, we have some good players for sure, right? But um, it needs to be a broader, bigger base, a movement of people. Again, it all comes back to media literacy. <laughs> of course it does. Of course it does. Well, I think understanding that, that where is the public interest representative anymore? You know, when, it, I mean, media literacy, yes, but understanding how gerrymandering works, how voter suppression works, and and the, the the ways that you siphon out the public interest, even the news media. I'm a former journalist. I believe wholeheartedly in the idea that we are the public interest. Even the news media is um, is is somewhat hamstrung by the fact that oh, hedge funds hopped in. Let's buy all that local media up and sell off the assets, you know, and cut costs. And so. Even the news media isn't maybe able to do its job. And then, of course, you talk about the educational space, which is supposed to be a, a, another space for that. Oh, let's put some money in there, which feels great because then it's like, oh, now I have the funding to do my thing. But oh, it come, and without even realizing it, we can get tainted. So where is the public space anymore? Yeah. Yeah. I, one of the things I was fascinated to see about is how Google got its way into American public education big urban school districts and how skillfully, how brilliantly skillfully they took over the policy making in local education around educational technology. That story hasn't yet been written. We need historians and a new generation of young people to sort of unpack some of those things, which is why I always say to, it's very easy to feel overwhelmed and you can feel like we've been talking for a little while. We like, wow, it's so complicated. Totally. But I always, I, I always say to my students, look, nobody, can understand the complexity of any of this, but pick a topic that really interests you and get to be the expert on that. Maybe it's going to be about fires and wildfires and climate change and fires, right? Because <laughs> that's a big topic. Yes. And and the more you study it, the more more beautifully complicated and interesting it becomes. So don't I feel like in some ways this idea is specialization is our friend. Right. And uh, I count on the fact that, um, well, let's put it this way, Gina, you can count on me to be really knowledgeable about media literacy, but I can count on you to be really knowledgeable about journalism, storytelling, new media. So we actually need to create that network of trust where we can depend and rely on each other. I don't have to be an expert in everything. Right. I right. can rely on experts, other people who've thought who've thought these things through deeply. And that's how we restore trust. Microcosms of that can happen in a classroom and kids can learn that we can learn to trust each other as inquirers. Right. And that's how we're going to restore faith in healthcare. That's how we're going to restore faith in climate change and and uh, management of forests how we're going to restore uh, faith in, um, in government and in pandemic response and all the rest. You know, I really love that point. Trust. Media literacy is about skepticism. Media literacy is about critical inquiry. Media literacy is also about finding trust, finding networks of trust. And I feel sometimes that, that we, I need to do that more. Thank you to my guest, Dr. Renee Hobbs, Professor of Communication Studies at the Harrington School of Communication and Media at the University of Rhode Island, as well as Director of the Media Education Lab and author of the new book, Mind Over Media, Propaganda Education in a Digital Age. This was part two of our conversation. You can hear part one at newsincontext.net. <laughs>in this episode includes Spring Fling by Track Tribe and The Heist by Silent Partner. In addition to hearing news in context every Friday at 8.30 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. on KSFP 102.5 in San Francisco, you can hear it on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, iHeartMedia, Google Play, Google Podcasts, Podbean, YouTube, and PRX. We're also on Facebook and Twitter at News in Context SF and on Instagram at News in Context. And you can find links to all of that at newsincontext.net. I'm Gina Valeria. Thank you for listening.